Good evening, and welcome to UAS's Evening at Egan. My name is Angie Steves, and I work at the Chancellor's Office. This annual fall lecture series is free to the general public and live streamed throughout Southeast on youtube.com slash UAS Southeast. There are two ways you can help support this event. Become a member of Friends of the Egan Library and make a donation to the UASAA Funds of Egan Library that we're trying to endow. Membership cards are on each row of the, of the chairs and you can hand them to me at the end of the program. You can find more information online at uas.alaska.edu forward slash Egan Lecture. A few housekeeping items before we begin. The bathrooms are in the back. The emergency exits are in the back over here. And there are two handicapped parking spaces located in the upper side of the building. Please remember to silence your phones. There will be time at the end of the presentation for questions. Please wait for me to bring you the mic so that our friends online can hear your question. And now, please join me in welcoming Dean of Arts and Sciences, Vice Provost of Research and Sponsored Programs, Tom Thornton, who will be introducing tonight's guest speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Angie. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, uh, Professor Robin Walls, who's one of our longtime members of the Faculty in Arts and Sciences. Um, in fact, uh, we just came from a, an alumni event down at the new Forbidden Peak Brewery, and uh, there were some older members of the faculty there, and I went around looking for funny stories about Robin, but they were all tight-lipped. They were just having their first drink. If I could have hung around probably another half hour, I would have had a much better introduction. But uh, so we'll stick, stick to the facts. Um, but the question about Robin might be, how do you get from being raised on a farm to Fantomas and French Avengers? OK. And I don't have the answer, but I guess you'll give, you'll give part of the answer in your, in your talk. But certainly one answer is education. So uh, Robin is a product of, of a good liberal arts education in history. So he took his BA at Whitworth College uh, in Washington State, and then went on to an MA at San Francisco State and a PhD at University of Cal Davis. And uh, I think it's there where he discovered his real love, which was uh, crime fiction uh, of a French variety. And so one of the things we like to do in, in these Evening at Egan talks is allow our faculty who have come back from sabbatical to talk about their research. And so that's Robin's focus tonight. But I'll just say I was a little envious of him when um, I came back from Europe after living there for 10 years to take this job as Dean of Arts and Sciences, just as he was leaving to go take his sabbatical uh, in France, and he took the liberty of describing to me at one point, I can't remember when, uh, the nice little apartment that he had outside of Paris, and uh, despite the fact that Notre Dame was burning, I guess at one point, right? Two days before, Two days before he left, uh, we had the experience over here of America not necessarily being made great again. So, you know, it balances out. So, anyway. Uh, so Robin has made a name for himself in this, in this area, really, uh, since I first knew him in the 1990s when he was uh, uh, looking at fin de siècle characters, uh, particularly this uh, character Fantomas, which has a cult-like following, as I understand it, and for which he is the keeper of the crypt uh, and the website on this character who fits into this larger narrative of shady detectives, elegant criminals, and Dark Avengers. So it's uh, my pleasure to welcome our French historian and also our erudite continental Europhile on campus. Every campus needs one. <laughs> Robin Walls. Okay. Uh, 
Thanks for that. Uh, right, I'm just back from a sabbatical where living in this uh, small apartment uh, just south of the city of Paris, I had the good fortune to uh, complete a rough draft of this book project, and I'm very pleased about that. I'm reworking it now. And um, just to give a sense of, you can see the title, and we've already heard about it. Um, the, um, the first two chapters are on shady detectives. The, the, the original shady detective in France was a guy named V. Doc. He would, had been like a, uh, he'd been in prison since, in and out since the French Revolution, mostly in, because when he was out, it was because he'd escaped, and then he'd get caught again. And um, in the early 18-teens, he, uh, he, he tried to make a deal with uh, the, um, the head of the second division of the Paris police to say, let me out, I'll help you capture criminals. And they said, no, 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 you just stay in prison and become a police spy, which he did so well that after two or three years, that's what he did. And they made him chief of the security police. I just want to, sometimes he's seen as the foundational detective figure in France. In my mind, he's always a shady character. He um, was in that position for 15 years. He uh, had an annual salary of 275 francs per year. And he left his position with over half a million francs in the bank. So he had been up to other activities during that period of time too. The, uh, the, the, the consummate elegant criminal, the foundational figure here, is a guy named La Sonere. He was the um, assassin poet. He, uh, he, was, he was just kind of a, he was actually a not very good criminal. He, uh, he bungled robberies and murders that he did with a couple of ruffians that he hired. Uh, but then when he went to trial uh, for a murder in uh, uh, 1835, um, he cut a figure in court because he was really well-dressed. He came from the bourgeoisie, the middle class, the educated middle class. He was very, very articulate, very, very witty. And like the courtroom crowd and the newspapers loved this guy. And they started like visiting him in prison. And he spent the, the month and a half between the end of his trial, which he was condemned to execution, writing his memoirs and like receiving journalists and other, other figures during this time. But tonight's presentation is on the Avengers, the Dark Avengers. And I'm going to start here. I'm going to, please forgive me, because I'm going to, I write things out so that I keep track of myself, okay? Um, I'm going to tell you about this story here. The Diamond and Vengeance is one of many stories recounted by a Parisian lawyer, statistician, and police administrator named Jacques Pouchet in memoirs drawn from the police archives, based on a supposedly true crime anecdote, an honest cobbler named Francois Picot was arrested by the police in 1807 on the eve of his impending marriage to the beautiful, modest, and wealthy Marguerite. Uh, three of Picot's lifelong acquaintances named Lupien, Chaubard, and Solari resented his good fortune in marriage and falsely accused him of being an English spy. During the subsequent trial, an accomplice named Alou corroborated their false testimony. Picot was found guilty, sentenced to imprisonment, and never heard from again. Rumors circulated. Some claim Picot was incarcerated at the Chateau de Fenestrel in the Savoy. Others say he languished at the Chateau de Luff in Naples. Soon, Picot had vanished from memory, forgotten and presumed dead. Then stories began to circulate about Joseph Luchet, faithful servant to the son of a rich Milanese cler cleric. Upon the death of his wealthy benefactor, Luchet received a generous inheritance of seven million francs. He also discovered his patron's stashed treasure of 12,000 diamonds and an additional three million in Milanese ducats, uh, Venetian florins, Spanish quadruple, quadruples, French louis, and English guineas. Luchet traveled across Europe and established residences in London and other major cities. In 1815, a certain abbot Baldini sought out Alou, one of the co-conspirators against Picot, who now ran a shabby roadside inn. Arriving at the sad auberge, 
Baldini offered Alou a spectacular diamond valued between 24,000 and 48,000 francs in exchange for assistance in locating Chobar, Solari, and Lupian, all living somewhere in Paris. Agreeing to the deal, Alou set off for Paris, found Chobar and Solari, and arranged for a rendezvous between them and the abbot at a cafe. The day of the scheduled meeting, however, Alou was shocked to learn that Chobar's corpse had been discovered at five o'clock that very morning on the Pont des Arts, stabbed to death. A hand-printed note in capital letters pinned to Chobar's sleeve read, number one. A few days later, Solari went into a convulsive fit in a cafe, collapsed on the floor, and died, the victim of a poisoned beer. Twelve hours later, the fatal glass of beer was found in front of Solari's lodgings with a message posted to the door, number two. The tale of vengeance comes to a climax in a series of misfortunes suffered by Lupien, now a rich coffee merchant. First, Lupien's prized hunting dog is killed by poisoned biscuits, and his wife's favorite parrot dies from poisoned bitter almonds. Next, Lupien's 16-year-old daughter is disgraced by pregnancy, the result of a false marriage to an abandonment by a purportedly refined and wealthy gentleman, who in fact was an escaped convict. Then Lupien's dissolute son was caught red-handed by the police breaking into a liquor, liquor store having been tipped off by a brother. And the malefactor is sentenced to 20 years in prison. Finally, the apartments above the coffee shop burst into a raging fire. The entire residential block burns to the ground. And Lupian has to pay all civil and property damages. One evening, in a darkened alleyway along the Tuileries Garden, a masked man approaches the financially ruined Lupier, identifying himself as Pico. The Avenger stabs Lupian through the heart with a dagger and leaves a message on the corpse, number three. Now, for anyone even vaguely familiar with the plot of Alexandre Dumas's The Count of Monte Cristo, the parallels are obvious. In Dumas's novel, Francois, uh, Francois Picot has be been transformed into Edmond Dantes. Marguerite becomes Mercedes. Alou is Caderousse, Lupian is Villefort, and so on. Literary critics have long noted that the diamond and vengeance provided the inspiration for Dumas's sprawling novel. And here I take a little aside, because in tw uh, 2013, Tom Rice won a Pulitzer Prize for The Black Count, a biography about Alexander Dumas's father, General Thomas Alexander Dumas, from Saint-Domingue, which was the name of Haiti before it was Haiti. Uh, the general fought on behalf of the French Revolution and served in the Napoleonic Wars. The New York Times says, it's probably too little to read, called it a fascinating, richly imaginative biography, which is true. Whenever given a choice between straight biography or one embellished with metaphorical flair, Rice always chooses the latter. He has another kind of really over-the-top biography called The Orientalist as well that I would recommend. It's a good read. Um, Rice claims that the fortunes and misfortunes of General Dumas inspired his son to write The Count of Monte Cristo, but this is incorrect. The writer Alexander Dumas shared few of his father's revolutionary or even abolitionist political views. And secondly, as I mentioned, literary critics widely agree that Pouchet's short story is the basis for Monte Cristo. Besides, Dumas didn't even write The Count of Monte Cristo, or not much of it anyway. His uncredited ghostwriter, Auguste Maquet, did. It was at Maquet's insistence that Dumas adopted the diamond and vengeance about an honest man betrayed by his friends, falsely convicted and inhumanely imprisoned, bequeathed immeasurable wealth that miraculously provides unlimited means to become a merciless avenger, as the framing device for The Count of Monte Cristo. For his part, uh, Dumas wanted to straight, jump straight into the vengeance story, but his silent partner persuaded him that readers first had to sympathize with the innocent and pitilessly punished Dantes before they could swallow the Count's cold-blooded and calculated crimes, entirely for personal revenge. Even so, over 80% of Dumas's novel 
was uh, uh, allocated for crimes and killings, meticulously planned out and committed by Monte Cristo, which vastly overshadowed the tale of Dantes's innocently framed and uh, innocently being framed and punished for a crime he didn't commit. And the Count of Monte Cristo ends very differently than the Diamond and Vengeance. In Pouchet's story, the co-conspirator co Alou captures the murdered Picot and in turn becomes himself a counter-avenger. Alou binds Picot in irons secured to a stone wall, deprives him of food and drink, and delivers a solemn and melodramatic pronouncement upon his captive. For you, no doubt, vengeance is a pleasantry but it's not, it's raging madness. You ought to be horrified by your actions, but you don't understand your demonic spirit. You have committed terrible crimes. You are lost, and in the end, you will follow me into the abyss. But in Dumas's novel, Dantes' revenge becomes a series of entertainments, cold-blooded crimes and murders dished up solely for the reader's delight. The restorative motifs of contrition, confession, and punishment that concluded traditional crime tales of rogues and bandits, widely distributed and circulated in cheaply printed chapbooks for a popular reading public for more than two centuries already. All this was entirely absent from the Count of Monte Cristo. Dumas's re readers took pleasure not in restorative justice, but delighted in the escapades of a dark Avenger hero whose vengeance was entirely self-serving. Besides, further, in Dumas's massive retelling of the Diamond and Vengeance story, Monte Cristo provided over 150 pages of sensationalist adventure storytelling to readers for each page of Pouchet's short story, which was only 32 pages long. It also took forever to deliver the story, published in 279 newspaper installments over a nearly three-year period, 1844 to 46 and then immediately republished, actually as it was coming out, into an 18-volume first book edition, over 5,000 pages in length. Uh, no, the Penguin edition, I got the Penguin edition. It's huge, in fact, I should have brought it so you could see it, it's a real doorstop, is only 1,250 pages, and, but the pages like, like four or five of the other pages, original pages fit on each one of the Penguin edition. Um, for this was the age of industrial literature, decried by literary critics and fellow, and fellow novelists, accused Dumas of running a novel factory that employed multiple ghostwriters to churn out his novels, including The Three Musketeers and The Count of Monte Cristo. But the reading public could care less. All they wanted to know was who the Dark Avenger's next victim would be and how he would accomplish his evil machinations. In 1844, Parisian, the Parisian newspaper, Le Journal des Débats, contracted Dumas to write a roman feuilleton, an installment novel, that would match the astounding commercial success that paper had achieved in Eugène Sue's The Mysteries of Paris, published over the two previous years. For The Count of Monte Cristo, uh, Dumas did not follow the mysteries of somewhere formula about the criminal urban underworld of a famous city, which had already become commercially successful, both within France and internationally. However, he did follow Sue's lead by featuring an Avenger as the protagonist of his adventure and crime novel. Yet the Monte Cristo was not based on Sue's noble Avenger, but his inverse. Sue's hero, Rodolphe, is the prototype for the prince in disguise Avenger, the uh, Grand Duke of Gerlestein, who in costume and under the alias of Rodolphe traverses, uh, traverses the criminal underworld of Paris with ease, undetected by its miserable inhabitants. Dumas's Edwin, Edmond Dantes moves in the opposite direction. First, he's a ship's mate for a Marseille maritime company and afterwards becomes the mysterious Count of Monte Cristo who passes incognito among the aristocracy and the financial elite of Paris. Count Gerlestein, born a wealthy and indifferent aristocrat, ensnared into marriage by a conniving and libertine wife, reverses the course of his life under the alias of Rodolphe by devoting his energies to the redemption of the orphaned street urchin Fleur de Marie, 
which is a, a bleeding heart flower. Uh, Dantes, an earnest sailor betrothed to the beautiful and pure Mercedes, falsely accused of tre treason, convicted and left to rot in the Chateau d'If, transforms himself into the Count of Monte Cristo in order to exact financial ruin and social disgrace upon his personal enemies. The narrative in Sue's Mysteries of Paris operates according to a melodramatic logic of a moral struggle of good versus evil, with the uh, Avenger hero committed to social justice and moral restitution. The Count of Monte Cristo and Fall uh, unfolds like a contemporary 1001 Nights in which a calculating vigilante uses his magically gained wealth to exact personal retribution against his enemies through the destruction of property and murder. In French, both Rodolphe and the Count of Monte Cristo are called justiciers, avengers, but they are not of the same type. The most popular French avenger in the second half of the 19th century was Rocambole. Like Jean Valjean and Les Miserables, Rocambole was a criminal turned avenger. But unlike Hugo's hero, there's no redemption for Rocambole, whose exploits as a dark avenger are as nefarious and murderous as when he was a criminal. Unread today, Pierre Alexis Ponson du Terrail was the most prolific and commercially successful novelist of 19th century France. Mo his most enduring series featured Rocambole, a criminal turned Avenger hero whose exploits constituted thousands of pages of adventures serialized in French newspapers between 1857 and 1870. Today, Ponson is remembered mostly through the adjective Rocambolesque, which means fantastic, incredible, resembling by its astonishing improbabilities the adventures of Rocambole. And the term remains current in French usage. You can, it's used in articles and newspapers and stuff. Parody is the foremost feature of the Rocambolesque, achieved through a pastiche of repetition and hyperbole. Ponson did not plot out and craft his novels so much as he readily copied and pasted them together from other works of fiction and sensationalist newspaper reports. According to one historical sociologist of, me, of media, quote, he didn't invent anything. He copied. He copied everything. Sentimental novels, horror novels, historical novels, the mysteries of Paris, and more. He borrowed from everywhere. He could write as many as five novels at a time, keeping track of each. Imagine the sources it took to keep that level of production afloat. He knocked off 10,000 pages a year for 20 years. Editing his, quote, complete works is inconceivable. His feuilletons were written from day to day uh, without a plan and sometimes without coherence. It also helped that by the later 19th century, popular novels had become incredibly cheap. For the first half of the century, reading was expensive. Books typically cost 10 francs a piece, and even so-called cheap editions for 3 francs 50 were roughly an entire week's wages for the average worker at the time. So newspapers and magazines were only available by annual subscription. So most avid readers joined membership fee libraries in order to gain access to publications. In the final third of the 19th century, by contrast, daily newspapers with installment novels published on the ground floor or the rez de chaussee along the bottom of the front page uh, now could be bought on the, on the street for one sou. A sou is a five centime piece, roughly a penny. Uh, issues of installment novels in small formats, uh, around 16 pages each, cost two or three sous. And fat popular novels, um, running up to 400 pages in length and printed on cheap newsprint, cost less than one franc, uh, between 65 and 85 centimes, somewhere between 15 cents and a quarter. Popular novels had become the commercial currency of popular literacy in France, well in advance of any nationalized educational system. As far as the character of Rock and Bull is concerned, he was a scheming, defrauding, and murderous criminal before becoming an avenger. In 1857, Ponson began an installment novel series called The Dramas of Paris, a story of half-brothers fighting over a family inheritance, a good versus evil conflict ultimately won by the virtuous brother. 
In short how order, however, the evil half-brother reappeared as the criminal mastermind Sir Williams. Up to this point, and that's his name in the French, Sir Williams. Uh, up to this point, there was no character named Rock'n'Bull, and when he finally appeared, he was peripheral, an orphaned kid who did odd jobs for an old crone country innkeeper. Then, Ponson accidentally killed off Sir Williams' hitman in a random episode. Needing a replacement, Ponson transformed the scrawny Rock'n'Bull into a handsome and physically overpowering murderous rogue in the service of Sir Williams. Um, in short order, however, dashing Rock'n'Bull eclipsed his behind-the-scenes underworld boss to become the wildly popular series anti-hero. After completing four novels, The Mysterious Inheritance, The Secret Jack of Hearts Club, The Exploits of Rock'n'Bull, The Knights of the Full Moon, Ponson wrapped up the dramas of Paris to work on other adventure series. Um, then, in 1865, Ponson came out with The Resurrection of Rock'n'Bull, uh, serialized in Le Petit Journal, which was the leading daily Parisian newspaper at the time. In this new set of adventures, Rock'n'Bull is transformed from a malevolent criminal into a justicier, into an Avenger hero. After five years of hard labor as prisoner 117 uh, in a Toulon prison, a reformed Rock'n'Bull becomes a champion of the falsely convicted, assisted by two companions, Milon, a good-hearted though dull-witted ex-convict, and Vanda, a scorned Russian princess with an avenging spirit of her own. Rock'n'Bull the Avenger was wildly popular with the reading public, gaining Le Petit Journal around 50,000 new readers. The plot of The Resurrection of Rock'n'Bull revolves around the kidnapping of two wealthy orphans, Antoinette and Madeleine, by the barons Carl and Philippe de Morlou, evil brothers who want to steal the sister's inheritance. Adopting the alias Major Avatar, Rock'n'Bull and his companions pursue and foil the criminal plot. Antoinette's story takes place in Paris, where a corrupt private detect detective named Timoleon uh, collaborates with the Morlou brothers. The plot against Madeleine occurs in Russia, where a, a treacherous Russian countess named Vasilika uh, travels back and forth between Moscow and St. Petersburg to assist in the nefarious machinations of the evil Baron brothers. In the novel's cliffhanger ending, the Countess Vasilika mortally wounds Rock'n'Bull during a duel by thrusting a sword into his chest up to the hilt. At the same moment, Vanda bursts into the room, draws a pistol, and blows out Vasilika's brains. With blood gushing from his chest wound, Rock'n'Bull rushes out the door. Milon and Vanda follow the trail of blood to the banks of a river. Ah, Milan cried out, once more he is dead. But Vonda straightened herself up, seething, furious fire in her eyes. No, she said, no, it's not possible. God doesn't want it. No, Rock'em Bull is not dead. And indeed, the Avenger was not dead as multiple novels followed. The final word on Rock'em Bull, the destitute of London and the demolitions of Paris. Plots were convoluted. A gang of stranglers from India terrorizes Paris. A fortune is uh, restored to a disinherited Irish lord. A villainous English lady falls in love with Rock'n'Bull. His character assumes multiple and unlikely aliases, a Scot uh, Scotland Yard detective, a German doctor, an English psychiatrist, a Scottish evangelist, a prison doctor in charge of executions, a 16-year-old peasant lad, and an eccentric English lord who keeps a scrapbook of curious crimes. The Rock and Bolesque series only came to an end with the Franco-Prussian War of 1870 and Ponson's premature death by smallpox in January 1871. The French literary uh, community condemned and mocked Ponson for writing the worst sort of industrial literature, produced by a hack writer who played to the basest instincts of a popular read readership. The multi-volume Universal Dictionary of the 19th century, uh, the editor Pierre Larousse noted, 
Ponson's work is based on a series of extraordinarily improbable adventures, and the vulgarity of his characters, mostly populated with hardened criminal types, is nauseating. The Catholic Guide to, Lit to Literature, Novels to Read and Novels to Ban, added, he published dismal and unbelievable novels full of impossible plots and newspaper installments. In them, one could find phrases such as, this man's hand was as cold as a snake's. Uh, literary, <laughs> literary paragon Gustave Flaubert, author of Madame Bovary, lampooned Ponson savagely. The year was 1850-something. October was coming to an end. An Amazon mounted on a handsome black horse of the Irish race galloped along the sheer route of Elberstein Manor. This Amazon was the Marquise. Some distance behind her, driving an elegant earler carriage harnessed to a magnificent horse, followed a thoroughly young man with extremely fine manners. This man was the Viscount. Oh, he said, lighting his cigar with lightning flashing from his eyes. Let me kiss your forehead, even if it means taking a bullet to my chest. But as far as Ponson was concerned, literary style was beside the point. The public loved rock and roll, and that sufficed. As one literary critic has noted, the pastiche author is not alone. The co complicity of his readers is required. Readers could care less about literary merit as long as the pastiche novel entertained them, combining familiar story elements with, and expectations with surprising swerves across the episodes. The commercial nexus yielded enormous profits for the publishers of popular novels, handsome incomes for their best-selling uh, best writers, and endless entertainment for readers dedicated to their favorite series heroes. This reached its zenith in the Belle Epoque transition from the late 19th to the early 20th centuries. Among serial novelists of the era, Gaston LaRue was one of the most successful. LaRue wrote in nearly every imaginable genre, adventure, historical fiction, romance, mystery, horror, fantasy, science fiction, westerns. Although today he's best remembered for The Phantom of the Opera, thanks to innumerable movie remakes and the musical extravaganza by Andrew Lloyd Webber. LaRue occupies a privileged Play, uh, space for his creation of the reporter detective uh, Joseph Rouletabille in The Mystery of the Yellow Room, an early closed room detective novel. But LaRue's uh, Avenger series was Cherie Bibi, originally appearing in the daily newspaper Le Matin in 120 installments in 1913. Cherie Bibi tells the story of an innocent man wrongly accused, convicted, and condemned to hard labor for a murder he didn't commit. In the tradition of Dumas's Count of Monte Cristo and Ponson's Rocambeau, Cherie Bibi is a hardened criminal and avenger without remorse. A quote, criminal with a big heart and a big dagger who feels no need for atonement or redemption. Instead, he is an existential and tragic everyman who rebels against the overwhelming circumstances that beat him down without any hope of overcoming them. The novel opens on a naval ship transporting hundreds of caged convicts bound for a penal colony prison in Cayenne, among them the redoubtable criminal gang leader, Cherie Bibi. En route, uh, Cherie Bibi leads a mutiny of the prisoners against the commandant and the crew, and he becomes the ship's captain. Several passengers are on board as well, including the Marquis Maxime du Touche, the man whose father, Sherry B.B., had murdered and then and was the reason he had been condemned to perpetual hard labor. Fatalitas, cruel destiny. For the reader will soon learn that Sherry B.B. is innocent of that crime, having been framed for the murder by a mysterious man in the gray hat. Inexplicably, on board, the Marquis disappears, and concurrently, Sherry Bibi is struck down with fever and quarantined in the ship's infirmary by Dr. Kanak, a homicidal and cannibalistic surgeon. In fact, Sherry Bibi killed the Marquis and had Dr. Kanak remove the skin from Dutouche's face and hands and then surgically replace them over his own. It's like that 
It's like Face Off, if you ever saw that movie, Face Off. The scene then shifts to the port city of Dieppe on the coast of Normandy, where the new Marquis du Touche slash Sherry BB and his valet disembark and make their way to the Touche Villa, occupied by Cecily, the dead Marquise's wife, and Sherry Beebe's childhood sweetheart and unrequited love. <laughs> Cecily takes great pleasure in the inexplicable and delightful transformation that has occurred in her husband, who now overflows with love and affection for her. Within this new state of domestic bliss, Sherry Beebe delights in, quote, a little taste of happiness with Cecily, and who nine months later give, gives birth to a son, Jacques. Fatalitas, fatal destiny imposes itself. A surete detective named Inspector Cousteau suspects that the transformed Marquis is actually the escaped prisoner, a convict, Sherry Bibi. To complicate matters further, Dr. Kanak reappears under a false identity and attempts to blackmail Sherry Bibi with documents about the facial surgery transplant in exchange for one million francs. Sherry Bibi agrees to a rendezvous, but instead of handing over the money, he plunges a, da a dagger into Kanak's chest slices his throat open, and tosses the corpse from a cliff into the sea. For once, the Wheel of Fortune has placed Sherry Bibi on top. But yet, once again, fatalitas. Sherry Bibi chances upon a photograph of Maxime du Touche as the man in the gray hat, which made the Marquis the murderer of his own father. But of course, now Sherry Bibi is the Marquis du Touche, in a rage, he sets fire to the Chateau du Touche just as the banquet is about to begin. As the dinner guests arrive, a monstrous figure appears in the Chateau doorway, engulfed in flames, brandishing a chest bearing the indelible tattoo, Chéri Bibi. With a final cry of fatalitas, the figure withdraws into the inferno. You think he's dead? Inspector Cousteau asks the following morning surveying the charred ruins of the chateau. We'll talk about that another day. And indeed, over the next 12 years, the dark hero appeared across a variety of media. A new Adventures of Sherry Bibi cycle began with the new Aurora, in which Sherry Bibi helps a wrongly incarcerated fellow prisoner break out of the penal colony prison on Devil's Island while murdering several people along the way. The final novel in the series was Cherie Bibi's Coup d'etat, in which the Dark Avenger helps Jacques du Touche, his son by Cécile, become the new Bonapartist emperor of France. And then Cherie Bibi assists in his political overthrow once his illegitimate son turns tyrannical. Cherie Bibi's recurring motto throughout the series is, as you've guessed, fatalitas, fatal destiny. Instead of blaming others for his fate, Cherie Bibi blames destiny for the, his wretched circumstances, the ones that repeatedly beat him down, and compares his condition to Oedipus the king. Here's an, a quote. Last year, Cecily and I saw Mourne Sully in Oedipus the king. Ah, that one was even more miserable than Hamlet. Fate brutally struck him down, killed his father without knowing it was him. He married his mother without knowing it was her. He was the brother of his own children. He tore out his eyes. And, and was that the reason he became blind? Depends on how you look at it, because it wasn't his fault. It was destiny, la fatalitas, that wanted him that way. Oedipus was more miserable than Hamlet, but less miserable than me. Near the conclusion of the first Sherry B.B. novel, he finally realized just how much more miserable he was. Fatalitas, I stole the skin of another man and have become a murderer twice over. By killing Maxime du Touche and stealing his identity, not only did Sherry Bibi knowingly engage in an adulterous love with Cecily as a false husband, he assumed, uh, his assumed identity had knowingly murdered his own father as well, which raises the question, why would French readers and film audiences identify with such a violent avenger? 
much less consider him a hero? This is a question for the whole group. I mean, for the whole group of them. A direct answer for Sherry B.B. is suggested by, uh, by his name. Beyond the common meaning of Cher as dear, like, you know, dear Carol, uh, it can also mean hard or strong. B.B. is a slang or argo pronoun for someone else or for oneself. So when barking, moi, Sherry B.B., at fellow prisoners, he's reminding them, me, I'm the strong one. But years before he became a criminal, he was the son of an estate groundskeeper, called Sherry B.B., dear strong one, by his sister and everyone who knew him. But after the murder of the Marquis du Touche, the former term of affection became a powerful sign of his inescapable condition, fatalitas, the, fateful, the victim of fatal destiny. His rebellion is absurd, doomed to failure, yet his passions perpetually drive him to revolt. The unrepentant criminal Sherry B.B. is denied romantic love and material comfort, basic desires felt by everyone. And in this way, he becomes a tragic hero of the people. So what kind of collective imagination accounts for the popularity of these French dark Avenger heroes, the Count of Monte Cristo, Rocambole, and Sherry B.B.? First, these dark Avengers have humble origins. Dantes is a Marseille sailor, Rocambole an orphan raised by a hag innkeeper, Sherry B.B. the son of a groundskeeper. Among their later aliases as Avengers, at times each is disguised as an aristocrat, but none begins as a prince in disguise, like Eugène Sue's Rodolphe, also known as Count Gerlestein. Second, each Avenger suffers from outrageous misfortunes, is imprisoned and branded a criminal for life. Dantes is framed for political espionage, incarcerated, and neglected in the Chateau d'If. The adolescent Rocambole is groomed by the genius of evil Sir Williams, double crosses his criminal accomplices, and later is arrested and sentenced to hard labor. Cherie BB is wrongly convicted for the murder of the Marquis du Touche, condemned to a perpetual hard labor, and transported to penal colonies. Jean Valjean's burden of living under the convict's yellow ticket seems pale by comparison. Third, each becomes a superman who commands others. The inestimably wealthy Count of Monte Cristo is a master of disguise who directs a multitude of loyal servants to do his bidding. Rocambole steals the identities of other people, betrays his master, Sir Williams, and assumes his place as the head of a criminal gang. Sherry B.B. possesses uh, physically overpowering strength, which earns him both fear and respect from the transport convicts that he orders around. These are men's men with imperious personas. Fourth, each lives according to the motto, neither good, neither God nor master. Ni Dieu, ni maître, the slogan attributed to the fin de siècle anarchists. But Dantes, Rocambole, and Sherry B.B. do not deliver a criminal vengeance against their enemies to achieve political goals, social justice, or moral restitution, only for personal retribution. Despite melodramatic plots and rhetoric, these dark adventures are not the redressers of wrongs, but morally and materialistic, materially opportunistic Avenger outlaws. Justice and restitution rarely extend further than one's intimate friends and loyal servants. And final, finally, each is a tragic hero operating under a fatal destiny that eclipses a happy ending. In The Count of Monte Cristo, Dantes does not reunite with Mercedes, his previously betrothed, but he banishes her with a modest income, and then he vanishes into obscurity. After restoring the inheritance of the kidnapped orphans Antoinette and Madeleine, Rocambole, as you heard, is fatally run through with a sword in the chest by the treacherous Countess uh, Vasilika, although he is resurrected yet again in Rocambole, the final word. Clever you. Sherry B.B. literally finds himself in the skin of his nemesis, denied love and wealth, and is repeatedly imprisoned and transported to penal colonies. Yet, each character has earned a place in French cultural heritage or patrimony. While not official symbols of French national identity, 
The Count of Monte Cristo, Rocambol, and Cherie Bibi have been recycled through a variety of mass media in France over the course of the 20th century and into the 21st in novel reissues, movies, television series, uh, comics, radio dramas, and audiobooks. While figures of nostalgia today, they're once contemporary readers and audiences having long since passed. These Dark Avengers continue to be heroes in the collective French popular imagination, if not identity. And my final slide here is to encourage you when I find another university press to replace the one that slipped off the hook, or better yet, find a trade press. If anybody has any suggestions for me for a trade press, I would vastly prefer that to a university press. Sorry, university. But uh, anyway, you can look, the, and these are just like covers from some of the other characters and series that are, gonna, that are in the book as well. Anyway, that's it. Thank you very much. I'm it's so happy. It makes me so happy to see all of you here because, I mean, there was like the event down at the new brewery uh, tonight. There's uh, just this uh, Sue Kazama and um, oh, Doug Smith are doing a wonderful piano concert down at the Jack tonight. And there is like a nude and rude burlesque review at the uh, Red Dog Saloon tonight. Yeah, actually, the, actually, there's a second show. You can still catch the second show. Uh, yeah, um, anyway. Th oh, yeah, and then there's Blue Ticket as well, which I think we're going to tomorrow night, I think, or maybe week after next, I don't know. We're going sometime. And, uh, yeah, I mean, there's so much going on tonight that it really, you know, touches me that to see so many of you here. Thank you very much. A few questions. Uh, sure. First is, how long was your sabbatical? How ah. did you decide the parameter uh, timeline that you were going to cover? And how did you budget your time with <laughs> uh, the amount of research that you were going to do to put into your product? OK, thanks. Yeah, that's a, yeah to give you a sense of like, uh, how, this, how this all works or how it, how it all comes together. I've been working on this book for a decade now. I sort of had the early ideas to put this book together um, when I had a, a one semester fellowship at, uh, at, a, um, at the Camargo Foundation, which is in the little town of Cassis, which is just below Marseille on the Mediterranean. Boy, I loved my time in the Mediterranean. It made me realize like why Odysseus spends 10 years on Circe's Island before he remembers, oh yeah, I'm supposed to be going home. <laughs> you know, uh, the, I think the Mediterranean is just magical. And um, so, and actually coming back from that, I gave like the preliminary, the first kind of, you know, version of what I, what I was hoping to do, where I was hoping to go. Uh, since that time, I've uh, given a number of conference papers. I've written a few articles. The, some of the material from those articles will be in this book. Um, and then, when it comes to applying for a sabbatical, you have to put together a proposal. And I was in consultation with a, a, an editor-in-chief of a university press, whom I knew, uh, whom I still know, who um, uh, uh, I submitted a book proposal to her, and then also included that book proposal in my sabbatical proposal. She was excited about it. It's like, great, go on sabbatical, send me the manuscript. And I thought everything was totally lined up. And then this spring, while I was gone, she got another job. And the press she worked for, you know, you get changeover in these people in these positions, right, of course, and who come in with their own lists of like books that they want to promote. And so uh, unfortunately, mine was no longer on the list. They said, well, we, 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 we've, uh, you know, set her list to the side, and we've got a new list now. So, um, so that was a little disappointing. But uh, let's see, I, did I cover everything that your question asked there, or, or most of it? I'm not entirely. Uh, just as far as 
budgeting your time. Oh, and budgeting my time. Yeah, so uh, in the, in, I had a, the entire year sabbatical. I was still here in Juneau in the fall, but in the in spring semester, I went to, uh, to France. And it's, I gotta tell you, I mean, Virginia Woolf is like spot on with like a room of one's own. You know, just having a space somewhere um, and an independent income. My independent income is two thirds of my regular salary, okay? So I have money to, to live on while, while, I'm, while I'm in this apartment. And uh, at first I thought I had an apartment in Paris and then we'll just say that didn't work out. And then I got kind of a long-term Airbnb where I could rent, rent by the month instead of the day. And frankly, that was great because I was in a kind of sleepy little suburb where nothing ever happens, which was perfect because it meant that I could get up in the day, make coffee and, you know, sit down to my desk and start writing. And when I got hungry, I could get up and make lunch and then like take a little nap on the couch and then get back up and write some more and then look at my watch and go, oh man, it's five o'clock. I better, I better go out for a walk, you know, and get out of this apartment, you know, and you know, that becomes daily life. And when that becomes daily life, working off of the materials that I've already accumulated, I really resisted going back. I've gone back many summers for a few weeks or a month or more at a time to continue my research. There's a little, there's a little library in Paris in the fifth arrondissement, in the fifth district, the left bank, called Bilipo. Bilipo stands for the Bibliothèque de Littérature Policière. So it's, it's a little specialized little police literature library. And uh, that's where I've done the vast amount of my research. The, uh, the director of that library, uh, Catherine Chauchard, she's so great, you know, I'll be working on something. It's one of those things, you know, where there's some, you know, it's not, you don't have full stacks, right? They do have some stacks in the reading room, some books, and I can consult them, mostly reference works, things like that. But like most of the books are kept upstairs, right? And so Catherine would like, uh, uh, you know, she'd say, what are you working on? And I'd describe it and I'd be working. And then she'd like start bringing me down materials from, from up above, because she's the curator. She knows what's in the collection, right? So all those things, you know, it's, it, you know, we call them single authored or sole authored books, but I don't think there is such a thing. I think it always takes a lot of people to help any book happen. Even, even if only one person's name is on the, the title of the book. Hey, Robin. Hey, Saul. Uh, good great, to see you. Good to see you, yeah, good presentation. Um, Did you laugh? I laughed, I was laughing internally. Okay, okay. <laughs> I know, you're a little modest. <laughs> um, I was wondering, so you talked a little bit about the way that this uh, popular fiction scandalized the more traditional literary establishment. Yes. Uh -huh. You see any historical parallels um, worth articulating between that <laughs> and like, you know, Scorsese's attack on the Marvel comic universe this past oh. week and the decentering of Hollywood through Netflix and those kinds of things? You know, you know maybe. And, you know, I'm not in the industry, right? So in that sense, I don't really have, you know, a position or a bone to, other than, you know, I like to watch things. Um, you know, I've got to say, it ought to be evident from the kind of materials that I work in that I don't give a lot of authority to sort of like high criticism about those kinds of things. Uh, help me out with the names of the director of Selma, right? What's her name? What's her name? Somebody come up with that. Yes, say that again. Anna Duvernay. Anna Duvernay, that's right. She also did the uh, series on, I think it was on Netflix maybe, about the young men who, uh, you know, were the Central Park Five, exactly. And I read a really, the, and the New York Times and the New York Times Magazine had a great article in the last year, but it's getting older now. It might have been earlier this year or at the end of last year, asking this kind of question about, you know, where's Hollywood and where's movie filmmaking going? And, and uh, uh, Duvray said, you know, 
I'm all about Netflix. I'm all about Netflix and Amazon and these things. She goes, you know, 20 times as many people saw my, you know, um, uh, uh, Central Park Five movie as saw Selma. She said, Selma won like an Academy Award, all that, you know, really nice, appreciate the honor, but I want people to see my movies. That was her deal. I want people to, I make movies so people will see them. And, you know, for me, kind of working in a popular vein, you know, I, I kind of go along with that. It doesn't mean that I don't appreciate super well-made movies, because I do. Um, the the La Air character that I had up there, he's a character, Air is a character in The Children of Paradise, that kind of great World War II movie that was made, you know, by like, by like trying to get extra footage and stuff because Continental Films, which was the Nazi organization of Nazi uh, occupied France, only allowed a certain amount of meters of, of celluloid for any given movie. And they, they made this movie that's like, it's like three hours long or something. It's got an intermission and all this kind of stuff. And the character of La Sonnerre shows up in what now is sort of part of the high film canon of French cinema. So, um, I think there's a lot of interaction back and forth, but people who just kind of complain about movies, I don't know, it's, uh, you know, I'm not saying that like, here I'm gonna do a little political aside, I'm not saying that like, people who support Trump are like, right, <laughs> okay? But I think that the criticism that uh, political, educational and financial elites don't, really pay attention to the wants and desires and needs of sort of everyday folk, of everyday people. I think there's a lot to that criticism. And that's the basis of the uh, Gilets Jaunes, the yellow vest movement that's been going on in France now for a, an entire year. It's a year old now and every Saturday there are still Gilets Jaunes. It's sort of like, it's like occupation on steroids really because it's not just in certain major cities, it's all over the country, in the major cities and also in small towns. So, and th that's exactly their complaints. These political elites are so out of touch with the reality of our lives. So thanks, Robin, that, that was great. Um, Good. I guess I have a question. You, you started with the short story yeah. that seems to have a moral and, yeah. you know, kind of every, yeah, good wins out in the end in, in a way, right? In a way, that's right. But, yeah. but, then, but then there's this shift um, as it gets rewritten in The Count of Monte Cristo and then right. in the subsequent stories. I guess I'm wondering if, if you think that parallels actual changes in French culture or maybe in kind of world, like, changes across the Western world and, and um, or if it's more just kind of a, this is the way the, you know, this is the way that the, that type of, story went or that type of writing went and I you know I guess I'm yeah looking for maybe connections to some kind of rise of existential thought and well, that sort yeah, of thing I, or not really I'm, I'm just kind of wondering. I mean I clearly in the Sherry BB I like start hammering the existentialist thing the uh, the absurd hero right um, let's see I think about questions like this so I've got a couple of things maybe to say one is I, I'm always sort of like wary of taking the big overview thing and then slap applying it to like specific things. But, um, you know, 19th century France from the French Revolution was obviously a pretty big time of upheaval. But from the end of that until, until 1871 with the establishment of the Third Republic and even that from was like, you know, France was politically super unstable in the, in, the, in the 19th century. They, you know, after the French Revolution, then there's you know, Napoleon, which who may or may not be part of the revolution, who, uh, then there's a restoration of the Bourbon monarchy, and then there's another monarchy, which is a related branch of the family, and then there's a second French Republic, and then there's a second empire under Napoleon III, and then there is a, uh, you know, a third republic that uh, has its ups and downs, and then, and so it goes. And I think in that kind of political, and also it's the time of modernization. It's the time of industrialization and transformation uh, where 
I don't know that France is a majority urban population even by the end of the 19th century, but lots more people live in cities than before instead of living on the countryside. And so social and political bearings, they're, they're not happening. They're constantly transforming. They're constantly changing. And so I think that the rise of popular stories where these individuals, for whatever their individual reasons are, are doing the things they're doing, whether they're the detectives or the criminals or the Avengers, kind of can resonate on a popular level because you don't have a lot of other stability, you know, uh, externally. So I think that that's part of it. The other one is the model suggested that you just suggest by suggesting culture, which is like that um, there is culture and then there's popular culture, as opposed to like, well, maybe, you know, culture is like what gets sanct sanctioned or official culture. And, you know, it could be that culture is really popular culture, but like we really want to control culture. And so we're going to institutionalize it in these kinds of ways, create literary canons and do other things like that. Hey, Robin. Hey, Roland. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering, so did this, this, uh, industrial literature, yeah. was that just happening in Paris or was it, did it spread throughout France through, you know, networks, publishing networks, or is it pretty much a Parisian thing? And I have a couple of other questions that I'll sort of do it. Okay. Um, and, uh, do, did any of the authors think of themselves as any sort of prose stylist? Yes. Okay, those are those. Are and two. then one more. Okay, great. <laughs> did thing is did did World War One interrupt like the mentality at all or? Okay. Okay. I'll go to the third one first, which is like when my book comes out, read about it. The short version is World War One doesn't really, but the kind of eclipse, the kind of end, the kind of if you will historical arc of this kind of popular novel and this kind of popular fiction is not really going to make it beyond the interwar period. Um, it's still around in the teens and 20s, but it's kind of in transition. And by the time you get into the post-World War II era, detective novels, espionage, romance, a lot of other things. First of all, I, didn't, I was gonna bring some, a lot of these books, the ones that I was showing you, I mean, they're big and they're fat, right? And I'm talking about thousands of pages and stuff. No, we're used today, I mean, there are still big ones, Stephen King and stuff. But like everything gets a lot smaller. A lot of popular literature gets a lot slimmer, gets a lot smaller, something you can consume a lot more quickly. Um, also, there's a proliferation of media, right? Um, um, films and radio, and then after World War II, television. And these things, too, change the nature of storytelling uh, and, and on a media level. So um, World War I, doesn't so much interrupt this as a lot of other transformations. So that's that. Second one, first, is this like a Paris only thing or are there networks like this? There are major cities that have publishers, you know, throughout France, you know, uh, Toulouse, uh, it was a big publishing city. Um, here, it's, it's my ignorance, which is nearly everybody that I'm working with is, is Paris based. And a lot of folks came from they come into Paris as be aspiring writers. They, they come there usually saying they're gonna become a doctor or a lawyer, and instead they start working on this writing career, okay? Um, in that, obviously people like Ponson, the rock and bull, he doesn't care about literary style at all. But another guy that I, um, uh, Paul Feval, he wrote a, a series about a criminal organization called uh, Les Abbey Noirs, Abbey, the guys who wear the black coats, okay? Uh, or the black outfits. Um, um, that's an extensive criminal organization. And he really prided himself on being a storyteller and a novelist and a, uh, uh, with an ironic side, quite a stylist. And, it, and, you know, and he had a chip on his shoulder about that too because like other people, uh, the, um, no, Mr. Arsène Lupin. Arsène Lupin is by uh, uh, Maurice Leblanc. Maurice Leblanc also started and considered himself a serious writer, a serious author. And yet, like Arthur Conan Doyle, he became tied 
to that character, to that popular character, and he could not escape it. In fact, when he tried to write another book and it wouldn't sell well, he'd say, oh, it's just another, it's just another Arsene Lupin story. I just changed his name, and then it would sell better. And uh, uh, Simino, who did May Gray, same thing. Like, he wanted to break out of May Gray. That was, that was a money maker. It would literally take him like two weeks to produce a May Gray. He would shut himself in a room and then sell it and make a bundle. He was really savvy commercially. Translation rights, movie rights, all that kind of stuff. Um, but he wanted to be a serious author. And he did write some novels. And, and it, it has quite a following. But he never got the prestige that he was looking for. So most of these guys, it, it, it varies. Some of them are just content to be popular writers, journalists, make a lot of money. Great, they're happy. And others of them were very much aspiring writers for whom they get kind of trapped in this popular writing place and resent it a bit. I think Jim kind of had a sense. sense. His, his hand was up like before anybody's, right down here and down the front. Jim and I had coffee together at Shakespeare and Company last February. Uh, Robin, I was just a lot of a lot of your uh, your remarks remind me of uh, Shakespeare's Falstaff, especially your la latter comments with sure. you know Shakespeare taking Falstaff after killing him off in the <laughs> the fifth, right. you know bringing right. him back for the Merry Wives of Windsor. Right, right. right. So and it just has a kind of a, a uh -huh. class fantasy, you uh -huh. know uh, uh, right. Falstaff representing a, a, a common sense uh, approach to things like honor and right, right. And yeah, I see yeah. that as kind of, a, it sounds like, you know, really a kind of root, you know, for the, the kind of characters that we see in, in the books you're talking about. Sure, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, no, no doubt. There's, there, I think there's more fluidity, right, over time and across cultures. I didn't even, I, I know a little bit about the, some of the realms that I'm in here in, in England. I don't really know anything about outside of those places, Germany and stuff, not so much. Good. Um, but... Um, um, you know, uh, I think that, and, and it showed up here, right? With Sherry B.B. Gaston Leroux puts Oedipus <laughs> yes, in I his can. popular novel. Right. You know, I'm even more miserable than Oedipus. And he has okay. to like tell people, he has to tell his readers who Oedipus is and what he did, right? Because he knows that the people who read his books may not even have any idea what Oedipus the King is. Oh, and you see things like that in, in John Millington Sings, The Playboy of the Western World, with uh -huh. the, the kind of Oedipal joke where the, the character kills his father, but not really, sleeps with his mother, but it's not really his mother. <laughs> anyway, thank you, I, I managed Great. to I managed to avoid both those things in my life, too. <laughs> Is that it? Okay. Thank you again, everybody, for being here.